Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are strictly the views or opinions of the presenter. Nothing in here is the view of the firms, corporations, financial entities that anybody represents. Uh, Nothing expressed here is a view of any um, regulator or semi-regulatory agency. Uh, All content is intended to be educational. Nothing in this episode construes specific investment advice. And if you do require advice, you should seek an appropriate advisor, be that a financial planner or a tax advisor or possibly a lawyer. Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. Uh, This episode, we're going to have some compliance credits, those uh, hard to come by compliance credits. This episode will be good for um, life insurance credits in all jurisdictions. It'll be good for a financial planning credit from FP Canada. It'll be good for a compliance credit from IROC and a compliance credit from MFDA. So we're going to try and run a few of these um, compliance episodes over the uh, summer here. I'm excited about this and it's a great time for it with the uh, client focus reforms coming on board. Uh, there's lots to pay attention to. Um, in this episode, I have Bill Donegan on and uh, Bill, you'll hear he really, I think, has a great, um, and I mentioned this in the interview, balanced perspective, just covers off all kinds of issues um, really seamlessly. And I hope everybody has these kinds of conversations with your compliance team. I hope that you get sort of reasonable answers back to your questions. I hope you ask well-framed questions to your compliance team. I think that goes a long way, um, not just to say, hey, why won't let you, why won't you let me do this? But rather, look, here's the activity I want to undertake. And Bill goes through some of this in the interview. Here's the activity I want to undertake. Here's how much of my time it's going to take. Here's why it doesn't Uh, present a conflict of interest. Here's why it doesn't present risk to the firm. If it does present risk to the firm, here's how I'm going to mitigate it. I think it's not enough just to say, you know, I'd like to do something and sort of assume that the uh, compliance team is going to um, read that the same way that you intended to write it. Okay, the object for today's episode is my calculator. It doesn't actually sit on the shelf behind me. It normally sits on the desk right here. Um, I'm a big fan of the BA2+. Plus. I happen to have the professional. I got it free from Texas Instruments. All you have to do to get a free calculator from Texas Instruments is write a textbook telling people to use the Texas Instruments calculator. Um, I didn't know that when I wrote the book, but uh, yeah, they'll send you a free calculator um, and a handy little emulator, little USB key you can plug into your computer to uh, show students what you're doing on the calculator. So uh, my favorite financial calculator right there. All right, Um, let's roll into the interview here. Uh, Lots of ground to cover with Bill and I really learned a lot. And uh, again, really appreciated Bill's perspective here. Hi, I'm here today with uh, Bill Donegan. Bill is the Chief Compliance Officer at Manulife Securities on both the IROC and MFDA side. That's it, Bill. Hi, Jason. How are you doing? I'm uh, doing really well today. How about yourself? I'm good. I'm good. I've got this cold that my grand my grandkids have inflicted on me, but that's I it. Got my uh, coffee and the yeah. summer don't mind me drinking coffee. <laughs> I'm drinking a hot water on the side here to try and keep this down. Uh, fired up. Um, okay. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Bill? Have you always worked in compliance or is this uh, something you made a transition um, from something else? Uh, well, I, initially, I, I was a lawyer. I was in private practice, called to the bar in Ontario uh, for about 12 years, and then um, went into regulation with the uh, Law Society of Ontario as discipline counsel, and my, my job was to prosecute lawyers for misconduct. And then from there, um, I went to the MFDA when it was just starting up um, and helped to, uh, I was one of the initial enforcement counsel there and, and helped to uh, contribute to the process uh, development of uh, the enforcement side of the business and uh, also um, uh, personally conducted a number of the initial cases at the MFDA. And then from there, I went into the private sector uh, as uh, Chief Compliance Officer at WorldSource, um, looking after the IROC dealer and the MFDA dealer um, 
From there, I went to Scotiabank and I was chief compliance officer for the uh, MFDA dealer in the Canadian banking channel. And uh, now I'm at Manulife Securities. Uh, we have a MFDA platform and a full service uh, IROC brokerage. And I've been at Manulife for about eight years now. Okay. That's a super resume, actually, because you have that, I think you spent time at a regulator, you spent time in sort of enforcement, right, or discipline, yeah. you spent time on both the uh, advisor, let's say the independent advisor channel and at the bank channel. So you would have seen a lot over that time. Yeah, I've seen a lot. <laughs> I yeah. don't know. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's kind of why you're here, right? <laughs> so, um, so given this uh, lengthy experience with... Um, Compliance and also, I'm sure, working on the enforcement side heavily informs your view about the role of compliance departments. Um, you know, I, I hear all the time advisors give grief to the. In fact, I had a conversation yesterday with a bunch of financial planning students, and they kind of gave their compliance department grief. Um, so, what do you have to say, I guess, in defense of the role of compliance departments here, Bill? Well, our, our job is really to protect the advisor and to protect their clients and to protect the dealer. Uh, by ensuring that everything is done in accordance with the regulatory requirements. You know, and sometimes um, it, you have to be, uh, I think you have to have a balanced approach. Obviously, there are a lot of hard stops. There are things that cannot be done, and you have to tell um, anyone who's, who's doing something which is just out of bounds that they can't do it. But, you know, it, there are a lot of ways to do things. And, and it, uh, it's something I, I bring from sports where, you know, there's a lot of ways in hockey to score a goal. Um, there's a lot of ways in our industry to get to an objective for the client um, in a way that's compliant. So, you know, um, I guess to skip ahead to uh, the philosophy for a good compliance officer, a good compliance officer will work with the advisor or whoever they're dealing with to try to really understand what they're trying to accomplish with their client and work with the advisor to figure out a way to get there without breaking any rules. You know, it's not enough to be what some call the department of no, it's gotta be the department of, well, no, but let's, let's try and understand what you're trying to do and figure out a way to get there. So, would you typically, like when you have one of these situations where an advisor wants to do something and it's not like a full stop no, but there's some, let's say discomfort or it's pushing at the boundaries, would you show that person like, here's the national instrument in question, you know, or how much can you, how much, what kind of tools do you have, I guess, to help that person where you don't have a no, but you have maybe a compromise answer? Yeah, it's, it's like you don't um, get into a, it's not wise to get into a debate about what a national instrument or an MFDA um, <clears throat> bulletin or, or um, guidance notice actually means or a rule actually means. Um, gener it's a job. One of the key jobs of a compliance department is to take the regulatory requirements and to, still, to, to distill them into dealer policies, which work. Um, within the environment of the dealer and the dealer's business model. And so, you know, we generally will look at uh, what is being done in relation to the dealer policy. And, and that's the starting point. It's, it's really not productive to get into debates about what a certain piece of legislation means. It really is all about how is the dealer managing that legislation and translating it into policy for conduct at the advisor level. And a lot of, a lot of our um, uh, requirements are principle-based anyway. So they require a lot of uh, interpretation and application to the specific uh, business model and uh, environment of the dealer. Yeah, that's great. Um, and we've actually, on this podcast previously, I had Ed Squarek on and he talked yeah. about principles-based regulation. Yeah. Um, can you sort of give maybe a little primer for us again. I know some people have heard it, but on that principles-based against rules-based. Yeah, it's an old debate. Um, in the USA, they tend to be much more rules-based. Uh, the FINRA, which is the USA equivalent of uh, RSROs, uh, has, a very, has a very extensive set of rules um, and they write rules for everything. And so then the game becomes, okay, the rule says this, how can we get around it? 
where in Canada, we have some prescriptive rules, and then we have a lot of general principles around things such as conflict of interest um, and, and other areas. And it's up to the dealer to take those principles and apply them to the model that they have. I like that model because, and, and you always have to bear in mind, what are we trying to achieve through this principle-based rule? And if you keep that in mind and draft your policies to suit your business model, but to also accomplish the objective of the rule, you'll be fine. And I, I personally, I mean, it, it's a debate and, and there, there are, you know, rules-based gives you very clear guidance. This is what you must do. But in our world where it's so many different types of dealer and business model, that one size fits all rules-based approach is in, in my opinion anyway, not really the best way to go. Um, so the, the principle-based approach can be more challenging because you know, there is a lot of thinking required to figure out, okay, what are we trying to accomplish here? How can we fit this into a set of uh, policies that works in our dealer? But um, personally, I think it's actually a better way to go. But again, that's my opinion. And there will be others that will say, no, we want a clear direction. But you've got to be careful what you ask for, because if you get that sort of very clear granular direction, as I say, one size fits all doesn't work in a very diverse industry like we have in Canada in, in the securities end of the business. I think this is a great point. So this would be, and I think this is something that some advisors find frustrating, yeah. but this would really well explain why like manual life securities will have potentially a different compliance regime than you would have had at Scotia and you would have had at WorldSource. Because yeah. you have different and business models. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, like actually in real time, we're living out um, this, this issue with client focused reforms. And, you know, the client, a lot of it is principle based around uh, know your product and know your client. Um, and how you actually operationally do it differs among different dealers. And I, I'm close to my colleagues who are CCOs at the other dealers, and we talk about how we're approaching various things. And we're all doing the same thing in a principle-based kind of way, but everyone's got little nuances that they're doing differently, depending on their business model, their back office systems, the service providers they're using, and it's not all the same. And uh, I think that's fine. I think it, it's, uh, you're able to take something and adapt it to your, your model and, and, and go with it. But, you know, I, again, I, I say when I'm talking to my colleagues, different dealers will do things at sort of the basic level of uh, um, operationally and, and through execution differently. But in principle, we're all doing the same thing. That makes a lot of sense. Now, you, you bring up client-focused reforms. How could we not in this conversation, right? Yeah. And yeah. what do you see as the biggest changes coming out of uh, CFR? Yeah, actually, I forgot to say this at the beginning, Jason. I've got to say this, that the opinions I'm giving today of are my course. own and not those of, of Manulife Securities or Manulife uh, more broadly. It's, it's just me talking here based on my knowledge and experience. So I should have said that at the beginning. I, but, can, I can cover it too. I'll, I'll mention that before I, in the introduction okay. to the interview in the recording. Okay. Basically, yeah. uh, because, you know, if I say something crazy, I, I don't want people blaming my employer for it. <laughs> uh, so client-focused reforms. Uh, where do I start? What, what's your question, Jason? Um, what's, the, what's the biggest change for, let's say, an advisor? So I've, you know, I've been advising clients for a decade now. And what is it that shows up in client-focused reforms that, that I should maybe be most concerned with or that is most likely to cause me to have to make some shift in my business model? Uh, yeah, that's a really good one because I think I'm going to give you an answer that you won't expect. Um, Okay, everybody talks about conflict of interest, huge, huge change. There's so much in it, you know, there's so much in, in client focused reforms. Uh, know your client, big changes there. Know your product, big changes there. But what underlies all of it is the documentation requirement. Okay, documenting the, you know, what, what uh, some call supersized KYC, documenting the KYP properly documenting your suitability analysis. The documentation requirements are 
in my opinion, probably the, um, in terms of actual work, uh, the biggest piece of it for advisors. Now, you, we can talk about KYP, there is additional work and KYC additional information to be collected, but it's all got to be documented and saved properly so that the advisor, you know, it's not enough to have the discussion with the client about KYC or to do the KYP work or to do the enhanced suitability work. If someone comes back and questions um, if that work was done, uh, because of a complaint or some sort of regulatory issue, three, four years later, the documentation must be in existence to prove that all of that extra work was done. So that's why I say, you know, that I think the real um, uh, sort of sleeper that people don't talk about enough with CFR is documentation. Now, in every- that vein, I, I think you're right. I think that's a big change. And I guess then if I'm, again, if I'm an advisor, how much of that can be sort of systematized? That is, yeah. let's say, you know, three, four years later, like you say, you're, there's some question about what you did with that client. Is the documentation I have going to be like 90% the same for all of my clients? And then there'll be, you know, like a 10% difference? Or is it going to be that the documentation is like 100% different for, for every client? Well, it, it, it's got to suit the client, right? You've got to know the client. And so, you know, it, it is, while, you know, you may have a, a common type of uh, client group that you work with, it's still got to be individual to the client. So if you're if I'm meeting with Jason here, Jason Watt, I need to ask Jason all the right questions and get all the information pertinent to Jason. And then if I'm uh, also working with people in Jason's household, I need to do the same thing with them. Um, you know, it is, it is at the client level um, that uh, information has to be obtained. Now, on the point of uh, systematizing it, that is really important because I think um, the successful advisors, even without client-focused reforms, I think the successful dealers and advisors will be the ones that provide the best and most effective digital tools and automation tools to help advisors manage all of the information that they they have to collect and administer. And those sorts of tools could run from KYP tools, which a lot of dealers are using, um, CRM tools, uh, either at in the advisor's office level or at the um, dealer level, where all of the advisors use a common dealer level CRM uh, for uh, uploading data, um, automated uh, risk profile questionnaires, another thing which uh, will help advisors get to this you know, new concept of risk profile um, are, I think, important. Although, again, there's a lot of debate about that. Um, and uh, that's, a good, that's another good discussion that could be had. Um, and uh, the dealers, in, to, to the point I'm trying to make is that automation, digitization, efficiencies in workflow, automating forms, using digital signatures, everything that can be done to make the the workflow more efficient will allow advisors to be more successful because it will allow them to more effectively serve more clients in their community. So going back to this idea of having the systematized, you talked about at the dealer level, um, and I don't know if you can comfortably answer this question, but I'll ask it anyways. Are there specific tools that like Manulife Securities has brought in with CFR in mind to sort of make the um, advisor's uh, implementation of CFR easier? Yeah, I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to name service provider names. I don't want to promote any one no, provider no. or the other, but, um, and I, I'm not just speaking for our dealer. I know that um, in the dealer space, there are tools, I mean, there's not speak about them generically. For example, there are a number of service providers that have uh, KYP tools that allow uh, products to be all products to be looked up, all of the characteristics of the product reviewed, and uh, they will effectively do a comparison of that product to other products in the same uh, category or classification, so that the advisor can pick the best product of that type uh, for the client. 
And there's a number of providers that have those tools available and they're very helpful with, with KYP. Um, there are a number of CRM providers um, at the dealer level and the CRM can be used for a number of purposes, but in relation to client focused reforms, it can be used as a place where advisors can upload and store uh, KYC information. For example, a financial worksheet, uh, risk profile questionnaire, and information like that. Um, it uh, can also be used to store client notes either, and advisors, I mean, and there should be some flexibility around this. I mean, advisors uh, may wish to, to uh, use the notes, uh, take the notes digitally on their computer. Uh, they may wish to handwrite them and have them scanned and P as a PDF and uploaded, or they may want to type them directly into the, uh, the CRM platform. There's lots of ways um, to do that, and there should be flexibility. And uh, uh, there are a number of dealers that are have built those. I mean, I, I think most of the major uh, independent dealers for sure have them. Uh, I know they have them. Uh, and then for the other, the other digital tool for KYP is, you know, part of the obligation is not only to uh, uh, do the um, initial analysis so the product is understood at the time it's sold, but also to be updated on material changes that might have occurred uh, to the product. And so there are tools as well out there that will provide updates, material change updates uh, to the advisor. So they don't, they're not worried about always, you know, following up in the news and looking for, you know, whether the, the manager on a mutual fund had changed or there'd been a really substantial uh, and serious problem with, a, with an equity that they've been selling um, and the like. So that, that's another tool uh, that is being used. So that there are a lot of things out there and, and most, uh, um, large uh, independent dealers are, are leveraging them because um, at the end of the day, uh, for, for lots of good reasons, client-focused reforms has sort of made it a lot more work to service a single client. So, you know, in order for an advisor to, you know, continue to service the same book and grow their book, there has to be efficiencies found. And, and the best way to find efficiencies is through uh, automation, digitization, management uh, of information. Uh, by that, I mean, I can see dealers having like more in-house tech staff, that kind of thing now as a result of this. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And yeah. And yeah. And, and also, um, you know, not just in-house, but working with service providers as well to get, uh, the solutions they need and and you know there usually is a little bit of customization for every dealer yeah 100 percent. now you have both um irock and mfda folks in your purview can you talk about how the conversations differ between the two um, distribution channels around cfr yes yeah um not a lot of difference, really. I mean, there's the obvious difference that um, the investment dealer, um, you know, sells different products from, uh, in addition to mutual funds. Uh, but the implementation uh, has been similar in both platforms. And the issues that come up really are, are the same uh, from both platforms. Um, and I think that's common across uh, at least the, uh, the industry that I know and the people that I, from other dealers that I talk to. The, and, and I think the reason for that is that um, the Canadian securities administrators developed the client focus reforms and implemented them as amendments to National Instrument 31103. And then the SROs, self-regulatory organizations, IROC and MFDA, uh, basically didn't have a lot of discretion in terms of how to implement those. So what we've seen is that the uh, uh, amend, rule amendments and guidance from both MFDA and IROC with respect to client-focused reforms um, is pretty much um, following uh, what is in 31103. And I think that's a good thing because it makes it, it provides a simple uniform standard I, I think that's a good thing. And, and of course, in a dual platform organization like ours, it makes it simpler because 
the policies um, for both sides of the house should be fairly similar. I mean, there are uh, issues on the IROC side related to additional product that IROC advisors can sell, that MFD advisors can't. So there is a little bit more specialization when it comes down to KYP, but uh, really um, not a lot of difference. And, and I find that we're, when I'm talking to um, advisors uh, on the various calls that we have around CFR, it, it's uh, the same issues come up regardless of channel. It's not like this is an this is an IROC issue or this is an MFDA issue. The the issues that come up are um, similar. That makes sense. Um, I I would like to delve into this like broader product shelf for the IROC side a little bit more if you're okay with it, Bill. And you know the idea that then like I can still sell individual securities, but how hard is it going to be to meet the um, the KYP requirements if I'm selling like a debenture for a junior issuer or you know stock for like even a big telco something like that how much like it I guess it seems like there's almost like a threat here that it just might not be worth it for anybody to sell any individual securities oh no I I no I think it's uh I don't think we're in that in that position yet at all um and you know, the, the core KYP requirements are you know, principle based, but it's obviously you're looking at different things when you're looking at, say, a large cap Canadian equity as opposed to a Canadian equity mutual fund. Um, you know, and you're looking at different types of ratios and criteria when you're looking at equities. Now, the tools that dealers uh, can obtain, again, from different uh, service providers. Will, will allow uh, for you know, the QCIP, you know, the code for a um, equity to be uh, um, punched in, looked up and compared to similar equities. So the advisor can do the comparison and also uh, the tools should easily present, you know, things like the PE ratio and other ratios that advisors think uh, might be relevant to determining say which stock in a specific sector is, is the best one to buy. And, and you know, a lot of the, the stock select, you know, a lot of KYP hasn't changed. Uh, I think the biggest change now is, as I said, the emphasis on documentation and the emphasis on, on knowing uh, not just in detail the stock you're recommending, but the alternatives that you could possibly recommend. Uh, but, um, and, and, you know, dealers should be um, in their KYP policies, being they should be fairly clear about the types of things they they expect advisors to delve into with specific um, securities, and also um, you know dealers should provide research. I mean, it's still important for advisors to look at research reports and save those along with uh, their notes and their analysis and their comparison uh, that they would do. Yeah, that's good. I mean, security side on, on the uh, yeah. with you're selling an equity or a fixed income uh, product. Yeah, uh, that that makes sense. That's a I think that's a helpful answer, and I I hope that you know people sort of breathe a little bit of sigh of relief when they hear that. Yeah, I'm not I'm not seeing people afraid to sell equities. I'm not seeing that happening at all. Uh, okay. Now you know that I was sort of hoping to talk about outside activities today. This is something that's uh, near and dear to my heart. I've had some challenges here with some uh, volunteer activities I'm involved in. So, um, so can you chat a little bit about the, and I'm not here to like pick on you for those challenges, Bill, you had nothing to do with any of this. Um, so, or at least I assume not. Um, so can you chat a little bit, first off, the, the name has changed. So we used to have OBAs and now we're gonna have OAs. Does that mean anything? Is it just taking an unnecessary letter out or is there actually some impact there? Well, it does mean a lot. They're, they're kind of updating the title to fit what is the reality now. Uh, because, um, I mean, traditionally people think of outside the outside activities as outside business activities. Those being businesses like having an insurance license or some other business that generates income and money. But, you know, a few years ago, more than a few years ago, um, the definition of outside activity was broadened to include, you know, if you sit on a, if you're a director of a company, uh, you may not get remunerated for it. It might be a small cap 
or, or private company, or if you're in what's called a position of influence uh, in the in your community, uh, those are all things that aren't you know or may or may not be considered business activities, but you know they are things that present conflicts of interest that uh, dealers should know about and and be cognizant of and uh, manage appropriately. So it it makes a lot of sense to just call it outside activities because it goes. You know, the the, uh, the realm of activity that's involved there goes beyond just business. So that was a good change. That was the MFD led the way on that. And uh, um, again, my opinion, it was a good change. Uh, makes sense. Now, what would be, and you mentioned already the carrying an insurance license. So, so in your mind, what would be the, like the no brainer, like this person tells me they're doing this away it's okay, this is the kind of thing we want our advisors doing, or this is the kind of thing that is a normal part of a, a business model. Yeah, I, I won't use the word no brainer, uh, <laughs> right. but uh, the most common outside activity, which is approved in a dealer is insurance. Obviously it dovetails well with, with uh, providing securities advice. Um, obviously clients that come in uh, for financial advice um, it, in many, many cases also have insurance needs. So it kind of dovetails well. Um, and it is the most commonly um, approved. I mean, I, 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 I would wager that uh, a very large percentage, probably a majority of securities registrants also have insurance, at least outside of the bank channels. So what about then, okay, and I've heard, the reason I ask this, because I've heard this as a challenge, what about something like being on an IROC committee? Is that an OA? Does that have to get approved? What's your, do you have an opinion there? An IROC committee? Um, yes. Yeah, like the, I mean, I myself, are, I'm on the Ontario District Council. That That is an outside activity. Um, it's come, you know, those sorts of things. I'm also on the MFD Policy Advisory Committee. Those sorts of things are, are not a problem. Fair. And so what about then maybe an organization? So I'm in Edmonton here. We have you know, Edmonton Community Foundation, which is a fairly like they run. I think there are about six hundred and fifty million dollars of like endowment type money now. What about that kind of outside activity? How, how much of a concern would that be? Well, then you start, you know, and again, I. I you have to look at each case specifically, right, right. to identify the conflict. But once you start getting into some community activities where an individual may be in what we call a position of influence, for example, they may be in a position to influence um, money being granted to specific people or organizations over others. Uh, they may be in a position, uh, say, coaching a sports team where they could have a lot of influence on, say, a young hockey player's career or um, someone getting a scholarship to a university to pursue their sport. Those are, or they may be, um, you know, in a, in a role where they're giving religious guidance in a religious organization. Those are things that all have to be looked at carefully to determine whether or not uh, that position of influence could be used in a, in a conflicting way um, and not in the best interest of the client. Probably so that the number one. Take, and you've oh, got to look oh, at them all carefully, Jason. They're not all the same. And um, they, you know, at the dealer level, decisions have to be made about whether or not, um, first of all, the outside activity will be allowed or avoided. And if you're going to allow it, then you've got to ask the question are there terms and conditions that have to be put upon this? Are there disclosures that have to be made? or um, other controlling um, mechanisms or conditions that are required in order to ensure that the conflict, potential conflict is managed and mitigated. Yeah, I, I've heard from quite a few folks, it's the number one I've heard is people who said, whether this is true or not, I, you know, but people say I had to stop coaching hockey. That is the most common that I've heard anyways. I yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, that's just someone's choice. I mean, I, it depends on, again, there's a big difference between, uh, say, someone coaching a very minor 
minor level hockey team with, uh, you know, that's, you know, and someone who's coaching, say, a higher level junior team where players are getting exposed to the potential of advancing into professional hockey or advancing into college or university um, yep. scholarship situations. So there, you know, you've got to look at every situation and, and judge it accordingly. So categorically talking- saying I'm not going to coach hockey, that I, I no, it's got to be more, there's got to be more to it than that. You're exactly right. It's typically been like somebody who's coaching yeah. 14, 15 year olds at a, relatively competitive level like that that's where i've seen the kind of cutoff happen yeah. i've never heard somebody who couldn't coach six-year-olds yeah and and you know you've got to look at every individual situation and make a determination as to whether or not um the situation can be properly controlled and managed right. because at the end of the day it's a good thing for advisors to be human beings citizens in a community involved in their community working with young people, helping them become better people and better citizens. That's, that's all good. And so we have to be mindful of, of balancing that, you know, protecting the client, avoiding uh, putting an advisor or a client in a situation where there is a, a conflict, um, balancing that against the broader social good of, and the, the needs of people to be involved in their community and help their community. I think those comments tie back nicely to your comment earlier, your point earlier, where you said this is principles based and it's going to vary based on the, the firm's kind of business model or business practices. So how much of this comes down to, um, like, again, back to my, my own sort of personal challenge with this, where, where I've run into an issue, how much of this is like, you can tell us you have this policy in place. So it, you're, you're going to go and, you're going to deliver, you're going to do some volunteer work where you might be dealing with a vulnerable population. And, and I think there is good reason to be concerned about liability. I would, I would not suggest that this should just be a no brainer, right? To use my term, not yours. Um, But how much of this comes down to like you as the firm now have to check in from time to time, you as the firm might have some I don't know, audit type concerns with this. And you say, look, that's just something that we, we have no way of knowing what's happening when that person sits down with that vulnerable population. Like, is that the concern here or is there something else going on? Well, yeah. And and also, um, you know, an advisor that, that may be under financial pressure who is less than scrupulous. Most of them aren't, but there are, you know, it's documented. There are a few, um, very small number, but they exist. Um, may well take advantage of someone's dependence on them um, as a caregiver or as someone giving them uh, pastoral guidance or someone that might be able to um, advance their child in some way. Uh, they may, uh, you know, make investment decisions. Uh, for reasons other than being the best possible investment for them as, as an investor. And the advisor may give advice that's not appropriate, but can get the, uh, the client to uh, um, accept the advice through other forms of leverage they might have over them. I mean, a, a big issue, or it's not a big issue, but it's something that's happened is what, what is called affinity fraud. And, and there have been a number of them where where you know people do work themselves into positions of influence and trust in various community groups, and that trust is exploited um, in a, in fraudulent and, and inappropriate ways. And and uh, you know I, I don't you know that that happens, and you always have to be mindful of of that possibility. Um, yeah. But again, you've got to also be mindful and balance uh, that against you know, the importance of people being involved in their community and helping people and being good citizens. So can you give an idea, like what would you look for in an outside activity like that, where somebody might be engaged in you know, work with a vulnerable population and you still want the activity to happen? Yeah, you well, want to be in the yes yeah. position. Actually, let me start off, let me go back. I mean, most dealers have a process, an application process for the approval outside activities. So 
you know, there, there's usually a questionnaire or some sort of form uh, where the activity um, is, approval for the activity is requested and a lot of and information is collected there. One of the key things we look at, it's a little bit off the wall, but it's it, it can be a showstopper sometimes is whether or not the, uh, it's the amount of hours uh, in the week that will be devoted to the outside activity. Because if the outside, basically, um, the outside activity can't be such that it interferes with the ability to actually properly serve clients and work as an advisor. So the, uh, the, the threshold question is, how much time will this be taking? Uh, for, and, and a good example is, is someone, say, running for political office. If they're going to be a member of parliament, that's a full-time, seven-day-a-week job uh, between the constituency and Ottawa. You can't be a financial advisor and be a member of parliament. That's impossible. But if they're going to sit, um, say, on a, a, a local council in a small town where the job is very much part time, they can do that, subject to controls that we may want to put in place. Um, but so the amount of time is, is the first thing that you want to look at. The second thing you look at is, you know, the possibility of, of conflict of interest and you know, who are they working with? What is their position? Um, you know, like if someone, say, for example, is working in an institution that, that may deal with vulnerable people, but their role is, is simply to be on the board of governors and they don't have any direct contact with the vulnerable people. They're, they're, they're at, a, at the higher sort of management level and they're not, they're not working with, with the vulnerable people. That's a different thing from someone that may be coming in and, and actually doing counseling and, and directly being involved with a, with a vulnerable population. So, you know, that's why I always say it comes down to what are they doing? Who are they in contact with? Um, what is the risk? What is the potential conflict? And can it be um, successfully managed? Typically, yeah. I'm oh. sorry, go ahead, Jason. No. no, go ahead, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, yeah no, typically the, the term and condition that you'll see where someone is working with a vulnerable uh, population. Um, and these, these are terms and conditions that might come from one of the provincial regulators. Um, it depends on the province, but uh, is that there be an undertaking from the advisor uh, not to have the vulnerable person or any of their family members or anyone connected to them as a client. That's a typical condition you might see. Um, and, and then, you know, the, the decision, it, it still falls upon the dealer to be able to monitor um, and manage that, that can, those terms and conditions. And you may and do that. Yeah, go ahead. No, sir, because I think that's my concern here, right, is, you know, again, how much can the dealer actually do that? How, how do you make sure that that person isn't you know, like they meet somebody and they end up with their parents. So maybe you're working with like a group of people who has disabilities and you end up with a parent as a client. Like how could you even police that? Well, there, there are, there, you have to have a comfort level that you can. And if as, as a dealer, you don't have the comfort level that you can police it, then you don't allow the activity, bottom line. What I've seen uh, occur is that if a dealer has a comfort level with the activity, they can manage it through um, attestations on a regular periodic basis from the advisor. Yeah. That they've complied with the terms and conditions. They can, as best they can, um, manage it through a review of the advisor's book to ensure that uh, similar last names aren't there. Household, you know, there's not a household there. Uh, but, you know, that's hit, hit or miss because someone could be related and not have the same last name. But, um, you know, I think the, the threshold question for any dealer is, are we comfortable with, with this? Um, and, and with our ability to properly oversee the advisor in, in this activity, notwithstanding at, at, at the terms and conditions were proposed by a provincial regulator. If the dealer does have a comfort level there, and that comfort level could be dictated for any number of reasons, uh, then they've got to address, okay, so how, how are we going to supervise this? And one of the more common ways is through uh, regular attestations. Fair. Another one I've run into here, Bill, 
um, is the difference between sort of like generic or sort of generic education versus specific recommendations. Is that something you've run into? So, oh, I, yeah. and I'm thinking here, like if I'm going to deliver, um, I think like a Will's Week here in Edmonton, you know, where yeah. um, you know, advisor might go in and talk about the value of estate planning to a group of people at the Edmonton Public Library, and you're sort of just broadly presenting about you know why people should have wills. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a line between giving investment advice, registrable, registrable activity, and education. It's sometimes blurry, but you know that there the line is there. Like it it. it the line starts to be crossed if someone goes in um, who's an independent, you know, independent financial advisor and starts uh, telling people they should buy a specific security um, or, or making claims about uh, performance that are unfounded. Uh, you know, like once it gets into uh, something directly related to an investment recommendation or uh, sales communications for the advisor as a um, uh, investment professional, it starts to cross the line. But if we're just talking generally about, uh, you know, the, the sort of content that you'd find in the Canadian securities course or the IFC mutual fund dealer course, you know, sort of high level, more generic industry information, uh, you know, that's, that doesn't cross the line. Uh, but, and also, if they're talking about more financial planning issues without giving, you know, specific, such as estate planning, without giving specific estate planning advice to someone, uh, then, you know, there's not a lot wrong with that. Although advisors, you know, if they are going to engage in that kind of outside activity, should get it pre-approved by their dealer. And, you know, the dealer may ask the advisor to provide, you know, the, the course notes, the course outline. Uh, for the program they're going to present, or if they're going to present um, at some sort of, uh, you know, general advice day, and they've got, they're going to be on a, um, making a presentation, say on estate planning, that they should get that pre-approved by the dealer. That does seem like the safest approach. Um, well, most that, dealers, uh, yeah, I'd say most dealers would require it. Yeah. On that note, what about media appearances, Bill? Yeah, I mean, again, it depends on the dealer. Uh, most dealers will require uh, advisors to have some form of media training, and they will require the advisor to have some sort of, you know, have the, the basic script of, of what they're going to say if it's pre-planned, uh, pre-approved by the dealer. Um, you know, more and more um, advisors, for lots of good reasons, and this should be encouraged, are, you know, creating YouTube videos, uh, engaging in social media and, uh, you know, without going into the finer details of that policy, every dealer has a policy on this, but, you know, basically something like a YouTube video, uh, your a typical dealer would want uh, to pre-approve the, the scripting of the video. And then after the video is produced, the, the actual final video before it would go live. And uh, I mean, I've, I'm not a registrant myself, but I've had some registrants on as guests on this podcast, for example. I've never found a problem with it for what it's worth. It's generally speaking, you know, we record like this. Yeah. I send off the, the raw um, video and audio footage. Um, you know, one time I had a, a compliance officer ask me to edit out one minute. Like, <laughs> it's, it's pretty simple, honestly. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah I, it, I, I, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, that's why we do the media training. Like, we wouldn't let someone, uh, um, I, I shouldn't speak in, about our individual organization, but I'd say most organizations would not allow um, someone to come uh, who is registered with their dealer to do something like this without a, uh, um, a, a having had media training so they know what they can say and what they can't say and uh, without, uh, after the fact, approving the the final product. Yeah, I do find it interesting. I've had an easier time with IROC registrants, getting IROC registrants on this on these calls than I have getting MFDA registrants on these calls. I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I can't explain <laughs> <It's>, that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, 
again, this is my speculation, but I, I think that you're just, you're more likely in an IROC firm to, to know your compliance officer. I think just the, the numbers kind of support that. So I think that can, that can create that environment. But again, I don't, I don't know if I want to go too far with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can't explain that. I think it yeah. depends on the firm. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes, I think sometimes at MFDA register, especially at the bigger firms, I think people just don't want their email in their compliance officer's department, like in their compliance officer's inbox. So yeah, that's, uh, I, and I, again, I'm not sure, but that's my speculation. Um, so Bill, you've gone through a whole bunch of different stuff here. We talked about KYP. We talked about that documentation requirement, which I think that's a great point. We talked about outside activities. Uh, any other items that you would consider important enough out of uh, the client-focused reforms that we're remiss in not bringing up here? I, I think we've hit on, I mean, we talked a little bit about KY, KYC. We talked a little bit about KYP, a little bit about conflict, a little bit about documentation. I mean, I, we could talk about those. They're very, they're, they, each one of those could be the, uh, the topic of a podcast in and of itself. Um, and, uh, but I, I, if you had any, if you think there's something we haven't covered, I, I'm happy to help you with it. I don't, but I do agree with you. I think what's going to happen out of this, I think there's going to be quite a few people listening who say, Hey, Jason, what, like, you know, why didn't you ask Bill more about that? And I do intend to have some other compliance folks on, maybe have you back one day yeah. and delve into some of those further. Cause I, I agree with you. There's a lot more to this, like the, to me, the KYC, we didn't touch on KYC hardly at all. Yeah. But really, because I, I know that's a, a monster topic. And suitability. You yeah. Know, the obligation to uh, now, the suitability analysis involves looking at the reasonable range of alternatives uh, for the client, uh, directly taking into consideration concentration and liquidity. Those are the new things, although in the past, liquidity and concentration should have been looked at but now they're explicit in, in the regulation. Um, and uh, the other thing, um, a couple of other things I want points are while we're talking about client focused reforms. One is that this is very much going to be um, something in development. It's not, you know, we didn't reach uh, December 31st of last year, boom, implemented, done, this is over. Um, this is going to be something that will develop over time. And the reason I say that is because it's principle based. Different dealers are doing different things. Um, issue, it will evolve uh, toward, I think, um, a standard that's well understood. And this process is pro probably going to take two or three years because the uh, self regulatory organizations, we may have one of them next year, but <laughs> be that as it may. They, they will be doing dealer reviews. There will be um, uh, compliance findings. They'll be refining their approach to the expectations from dealers. And so it will evolve over time. And so, you know, what, what I would say to our advisors and, and, you know, to anyone in the industry is don't be surprised if your um, dealer policies evolve and change. The other thing I wanted to talk about, you know, that, oh. that's not... That's, that was made part of CFR that, again, people don't talk about enough is the trusted contact person. Yes. Because in the, the KYC rule, the new KYC rule, there is a requirement for the advisor to ask the client if they want to appoint a trusted contact. That yeah. must be done every, at the, uh, every time KYC is taken, either an update or at the count opening. And that's a new thing. And, and that's course, not age specific. I know a lot of people have been doing this sort of for yeah. like older, which I think is wrong anyways. I think this should have never been age specific, but this is, yeah, this is a great point. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, it's not age specific. And, you know, the rationale for that is that um, there are, I mean, it's not meant to um, just address the possibility of dementia or, you know, mental decline in, in a senior. It, it's also to address any other sort of issue where um, you know you, the advisor might reasonably suspect that 
there's a problem with the client, like addiction. Um, you know, there may be medication the client's on, which is clouding their judgment. Um, that there may be mental Rod health or a scam. That, Sorry, go ahead. I passed. Yeah, mental health yeah. issues at a younger age, frauds and scams. Absolutely, um, I can't tell you how many uh, you know what they call romance type scams uh, we've been seeing um, and acting upon. And so, trusted. Yeah, it's not just a senior thing. And I, I know there's been a lot of uh, now. It's a requirement. We. A lot of dealers rolled out the trusted contact form and uh, uh, policy uh, even before uh, this year, but now it's become a mandatory part of the KYC process. Uh, there's a lot more focus on it. I, I think that's such a great change. I think that protects advisors in a lot of ways. Like that, that's one that you know, four or five years from now, you're going to have a bunch of stories about advisors who use that trusted contact to yeah. great effect. It generates a lot of questions. And, and, you know, I've had advisors basically say to me exactly what you're saying is that until you're actually in that situation with a client, you don't realize how important it is to have that contact to reach out to. Yeah, absolutely. I also think it just opens the door. And I mean, I have bias towards financial planning, Bill, but I think it opens the door to a bunch of good financial planning questions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I, I was really happy to see that in the CFR. I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. All right. Um, well, that's uh, that's going to take us to time here, Bill. You've been okay, just a wealth you. of uh, knowledge. I really appreciate your uh, just your ability to share with us. You have that uh, depth of experience, and I think you have a really balanced view of this. I think that's it was Curtis Finley who sent me over to chat with you, and I think that's why Curtis uh, recommended this conversation. Um, so thanks so much for that. Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> you can Jason. Say hi to him. Yeah. And uh, have a wonderful day. Okay. Bye, Jason. Thanks. Yeah, again, just tons of great stuff there. I think there's something there for everybody, even if you're not working in a securities environment. I think there's lots of good advice there. And Bill said it, he said, document everything. And I know we all say this, everybody says document, document, document. I just don't think that we necessarily appreciate the extent to which this is actually required. So I would suggest that, you know, fine, document when you met with the client, document what you talked about, but what's required under client-focused reforms, and I don't think this is really any different on the insurance side, is that now you have to be able to document why it is that you made a specific recommendation. What is it that you thought about? What paths did you consider? when developing the plan for that client. I think this is going to work well for those who uh, carry CFP certification, who do financial planning as part of their day in and day out uh, process. Um, if you're not writing full on financial plans for clients, I still think that you wanna think about what can I bring in to my current process from that financial planning side. Um, the sort of bare minimum stuff that we capture in our um, client relationship management software, I just don't think is going to cut it. There's got to be fairly substantial evidence here for um, every type of recommendation you make to a client. And I think this is good. I think that it's going to increase some people's workloads. I totally understand that. Um, but I think that this is going to result in uh, more evidence-based recommendations. I don't think that's going to hurt anybody. And um, ideally result in clients with a better understanding as to why their advisor recommended something. Okay, the number for today's episode is four. The number for today's episode is four. Thank you very much. And please do join me again in two weeks time for our next episode.